the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Today we have the gospel account of our Lord doing good and challenged for doing good by the Pharisees. Sometimes doing good is going against against some kind of sights and some uh, visions. Sometimes you do good, and I hear this in confession. A lot of people come to me and say, Abuna, whenever I try, I hear it like a million times. This is the most common complaint I hear. Whenever I try to do good, I get evil in return. Have you heard that before? Did you say that to yourself? Always the case. So this is, in this, Jesus is not different. He is trying to do good, and the Pharisees is trying to catch what's wrong with this. There's something wrong with this picture. He cannot be doing this. We hate it. Anyway. So uh, there is this theme about the Lord, and I want to start reading you a description, before we go back to the gospel, about the Lord from the apostles. When the apostles were preaching the name of Christ and they were telling everybody about Jesus, you have this very, uh, very short version of what they were talking about in chapter 10. And it's the second part of chapter 10, verse 38. We'll read a little bit before it. This is when Peter was speaking to an Italian soldier. Actually, he was a centurion, a leader of a hundred soldiers, who was a pious man. A man, I want to describe this man uh, to you. Look, look at this. He says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man. Interesting. You have an Italian who they have their own gods at the time, but he lives in Caesarea in, in Judea, in Israel, I mean. But he was a devout man. He knew God, who feared God with all his household. He's not only him, but only his family. Everyone in his house knew God and feared God, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He was a good man by the standard of the world. He was a good man. And we should leave him alone, I guess. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed, he was awake. He was afraid. That's not a dream. And said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Because he did it out of good heart and good to give it to God, and because of God, it was remembered by God. And I want to just keep that in your mind, that whenever someone does something good for the sake of God and the kingdom, God does not ignore it. It's not ignored. And now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. So out of God's goodness in return, for Cornelius' good works, for the sake of God, God is going to return a favor, and he is going to give him something very precious in return. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. He has people that is godly people, are godly people around him to serve him in his house. Everyone around Cornelius, it seems like, is affected by his quest for God. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. And they had to visit the house where Peter was there. And there's a story here that I'm going to skip over about what is happening to Peter at the same time to convince him to go to that man. Peter was not convinced as a Jew to go to a foreigner, a Gentile, uncircumcised, defiled, you name it, dogs, swine, have a big list of that. Those names apply to anybody who's not Jews, by the Jew. So I'm going to skip over the story because the vision to Peter was to convince him to go. Now we go to the place um, 
where he visits. Peter is going to visit this good man. Then he invited them and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Java accompanied him. So you have the group from the Italians, the Romans, and a group from the Judeans are going to visit them. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. This is a great thing. Cornelius said, if heaven wanted me to see this visitor and listen to him, I better call everyone. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. That's tough. That's very humble. You imagine this? Romans despised anybody who's not Roman. They used to crucify criminals who are not Romans, but they would chop the head of a Roman to get him done quickly. Out of despise and out of hatred and uh, enmity and feeling superior, they would treat foreigners totally different. But with this man, he worshipped him. Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. There was a big church there. And then Peter told him it's very difficult, and, and he's explaining to him what Peter had seen, and Cornelius too explained to him what he had seen. There were two visions. They had to meet and explain those visions. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Two conditions. Two conditions. In every nation who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. These are the two descriptions for Cornelius. Cornelius is a, he's a man, he's a God-fearing man who does righteousness. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, this is now the job of us, the Israelites, he's saying. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. He's going to tell him a little bit about Jesus. How God anointed, listen, anointed means to be a Messiah, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about, look, look, listen to this, about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So, he speaks to a righteous man who does a lot of good about the Son of God who was a righteous person who, does, who did a lot of good. And we are witnesses, he says, of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree, just because he was doing good. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before, the, before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us, the commanded apostle, to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Point. So doing good was the beginning. Remission of sins and eternal life is the goal. So doing good in itself is not enough. What doing good is, the goal is, is to reach forgiveness of sins and to also be accepted by God into eternal life. That's what Isaiah would say. Listen to what the prophets had said. Because Matthew, talking to the Jews, Matthew said, this is whom it was written, it was fulfilled about him that... Uh, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. This is about doing good in the gospel. Let me go back with you to Isaiah and read this chapter about Jesus because you have it in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Peter preaching Jesus doing good. The book of Isaiah had already foretold that. And it is Isaiah 42. It is him that St. Matthew is citing here for us to go back to. And we should go back to. Whenever the Bible is citing a verse or a chapter, read the whole thing. This is Isaiah 42 that is brought to us today when Jesus healed a man with withered hands. He hands with paralyzed. Jesus touched him and he healed him. But it was on a Sabbath. 
And that's what made the Pharisees very much complain. This is what Isaiah says. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. You've heard this before, didn't you? You've heard, when was it said, my servant or my beloved in whom I'm well pleased? In the transfiguration and in baptism. The father is always saying this about the son. The father is always saying, he is my beloved. Look at him. Pay attention to him. He is the one I'm very pleased with. He makes my heart very glad. Look, look at the, the language that God the Father is using. He says, in whom my soul delights, he's delighted from inside. The, the guts of the Father gets out when Jesus does things. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. So when the Pharisees fought with him, what did Jesus do? He answered very logically and calmly. He didn't get excited like I get excited sometimes, or you get excited over arguments. He's not argumentative. He's bringing out common sense, logic. So when they argue with him about why you're doing this in the Sabbath, what did he say? Do you rescue a sheep or donkey if it falls in the Sabbath? They said, yes, our law permits us to bring a sheep or a donkey from a pet or uh, if it's caught in somewhere dangerous, we can work that work that way. He said, so you're, you're worried about the donkey and you care about the sheep and you don't care about the children of God, people. So he doesn't argue. He brings out the right answer. And then he goes on to say, a bruised reed he will not break. When do we bruise, when we break a bruised reed? When do you go and destroy things, usually? Have you seen that? People punching walls or throwing things, taking a vase and just slamming it against the wall or breaking a, 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 like a, a mirror because it didn't show the favorable uh, picture or taking a picture of somebody that you got angry with and you just smash it on the ground. Would he do that? He doesn't have any of those emotions in his heart. He is the king of peace. He is the source of our peace. So he does not break a, a bruised reed and does not quench a, a smoking flax and he will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coast land shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord who has created the heaven and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, he speaks to his son, and will hold your hand, I will keep you, and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Jesus tells us in the New Testament, I am the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness. And he continues to open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the prison to those who sit in darkness from prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Here is a hint about the divinity of Christ. This is going to do to his son, who is a true God of true God. That's not to give a human being this grace or, a, uh, or glory. So Jesus comes to do good. What is the ultimate good that Christ wants to do again? The ultimate good is not to heal a sick person, not to give food to a hungry person, not to give money to a poor person. What is the ultimate good that Jesus came to do? To forgive our sins so we, cannot, we don't enter into eternal damnation. If you love somebody, truly love them, you want to give them the best thing you can. And the best thing that God can give us is eternal life. How can we see eternal life when we are not forgiven? People stay cut off from God, can't speak to him, can't go and stand before him. They're afraid to speak because they know down deep down they are guilty. We all are. So the ultimate thing that Jesus, not just to heal, he healed. The book of Acts in Peter talking to Cornelius said he was going around doing good. Meaning, he was homeless. And th think about it. Jesus was homeless. Imagine you meet a homeless 
at the light, and that homeless heals your hand, or heals your blood pressure, or takes away diabetes from you, and he's a homeless. What would you think? He was poor, but he made many rich. So Jesus, we got us rich by his poverty. So sometimes we think, and this is a problem, we think good is limited to these things. Feeding the poor, bringing, uh, uh, giving shelter to the homeless. This is not what God is going to stop at. To be a child of God, you have to bring Christ light to people. That's the ultimate good. That's what St. Peter said. Cornelius was a great man. From the perspective of humanity, from humanism, he was the best man you can imagine. He's doing a lot of good. And God loved him, by the way. It's not that God didn't like Cornelius, but God wanted Cornelius to have more. What is the more that God wanted to have? He wanted him to have Jesus, to have Christ, to be part of the church. So I want us to think about this. What is good when you think about good? The ultimate good is God because he's the source of all goodness. Think about it. You're giving money. Who gave you the power to make money? You have food to feed the hungry. Who gave that food? Who made that food? Created that food, invented that food, and gave us a health to go and buy food. If your eyesight has um, the uh, short-sightedness and you need glasses, you're only seeing this temporal surrounding me. You can like ask a child, who brings the food? Mama, Baba. Sure, that's good. But where does Baba, Mama get the food from? From the grocery store. Where does the grocery store? From the farm. Okay. That's okay. That's good. But there's an ultimate good. As a mature person, we need to know the ultimate good comes from God. And to deny that, we deny the source of all goodness. And that's what God wanted to do with Cornelius today in this story. And what is Jesus doing? And the eyesight of the Pharisees were myopic, has myopia. They needed to see far beyond the breaking of the Sabbath. The same way, the same way. They were just short-sighted by, he's doing things on the Sabbath. But understand, do understand. Even your law allows things to be done on the Sabbath. But because you are hateful and you hate Christ so much and want to catch him and do things wrong, you're going to focus on that one and be short-sighted to see the bigger picture. So how do we get, and I want to conclude with that, how do you get to be good? It's actually to have him. And that's what this, to be ultimately good, is to have Christ. It's to have him. Otherwise, God will not do this big journey. Actually, this, this story is going to be said twice. Chapter 42, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11 in Acts. This story is repeated exactly the same way, twice. Why? To make sure that we understand that we cannot be, quote-unquote, good without being with Christ and in God. So to, to make the practical part, how do I get to be with Christ? Is when you stand before him in prayer. When you stand to pray and his image is imprinted on you. You cannot, you know, I'll tell you something, go befriend an alcoholic. What's the risk? What's the risk if he spends all time in the clubs drinking and you're going to be with him or her? You befriend a foul language speaker. What is the risk? Go befriend Christ. What is the risk? You will lose your life, maybe. It's an earthly life, but what will you gain? He will be imprinted on you. We are becoming very much, we are humans, are very sensitive to who we become close to. St. Paul was going to say this in 2 Corinthians. You go look for it if you want. He says that the image of Christ is imprinted on us. So we become good because we have the source and we are exposed to him. How you do this, this is your quest. Invest your energy. Look for how to become one with Christ. I'm not going to keep saying it and repeating it. You might have heard it in Sunday school and Sunday school kids can answer that better than me. But you need to do it. How do you get Christ to be imprinted on you so you actually can be truly good? And God will say, this is my be beloved servant in whom I am well pleased. May him... And the Son and the Spirit be glorified now and forever unto ages of all ages.